Um, so my contact details are up there. They'll be on the last slide. So if you've got any questions about this or um, things that I've um, come up with, by all means, get in touch. Um, I look forward to it. So an overview of what I'll go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but ah, so there you go. Uh, there we are, lovely. Um, what I'm quickly going to go through is a bit of a background to the work I've done, or we've done, uh, I should say. There's a whole team of us working on this project. And um, for very quickly getting through to the path, what pathways for WUSID implementation in the state that we've identified. And they're quite generic, so um, I'm not going to go into great detail today. So um, you know, you won't need, hopefully won't need the sticks keeping the eyes open. Um, be a bit of background on what the Goiter Institute for Water Research is. Um, it's a, and I've misspelled research, wonderful. <laughs> um, a, it's a partnership between the South Australian government, specifically Department for Environment, Water, Natural Resources, and CSIRO, Flinders University, University of Adelaide, and of course, University of South Australia. Um, and it's focused on demand-driven research and research to inform policy. So any of the projects that are generated, uh, have been generated to address a demand or a policy question of some sort. Um, now, there was a phase one water sensitive urban design project completed last year, uh, and that focused on identifying impediments and drivers for water sensitive urban design, what's in ground at the moment, and how it might be going um, to the best that we could discover. And I've got a misspelling on impediments too. Geez, I've done well. Uh, and uh, the current project is uh, water sensitive urban design project phase two. Um, the intention of that project is to um, look at uh, what we can do in the future um, to implement water sensitive urban design, technologically, which is another aspect of the research, as well as in policy, which is where, um, what I'm talking about today. So without too much fussing around, uh, the possible options that we've addressed in our work have included uh, development plans, um, engineering service levels or standards within council, uh, the residential code, the building code, uh, development of further minister's specifications, um, a levy or offset mechanism, um, and also there's potential pathways through the SA planning reform path, pr reform process which is underway, um, which I won't go into great detail on. Um, it's all very much a fluid area, so we haven't sort of covered it in great detail. Hopefully this will change. I'm scared to press it again. Let's see how we go. There we are, lovely. So option one, was um, there's actually three options within the development planning process that are quite obvious. Um, uh, the first one is that uh, principles of water sensitive design are already in the SA planning policy library. And 19 of the 27 Adelaide based councils have already taken up these planning policies. So the simplest answer that some people have given when we've spoken about it is why aren't people just applying them? They're already there. Um, these are qualitative, however. Um, so these, uh, each council has to determine how they interpret um, what, what the SA planning policy library is saying. Um, and so there's a bit of a lack of willingness to apply them, quite obviously because they're, it's open to interpretation, it can be challenged. Um, is it worth the effort? Can you end up spending a lot of time trying to get someone to do something which they don't want to do and may not end up doing? Um, Interestingly, there's no cases in the um, South Australian Environment Resources and Development Court that specifically relate to those that um, we could find. So it looks like there's never really been the precedent tested, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea because I know that would be a long and costly and time-consuming process. Um, so it's a bit open. There are policies there. They could be enforced better, possibly, but um, I think people want a bit more certainty on what... Uh, we can do. So option two, given this concern with the existing uh, policies, would be for local government to address water sensitive urban design in their own DPA to suit themselves. Um, this would be effectively following a path like that in New South Wales that um, Mark spoke about, uh, where individuals or councils are basically going their own way in their own planning policy. Um, technical justification is required. And to some extent, this exists where there's stormwater management plans which are active. Um, and there's also things like the Adelaide Coastal Water Quality Improvement Plan and the recent South Australian Water Sensitive Urban Design Policy, which could potentially be lent on. The difficulty with this is that um, I think the flavour of the month in planning is for uniformity. And if everyone went their own way, we could end up doing the very opposite of that. Um, 
and this lack of consistency also drives up costs for developers and um, it's a necessary process development. So we, um, it's not really, you can't put in place a policy that's going to uh, be a stopgap of some sort. It also raises concerns over regional equity if one council's forcing you to do the nth degree and one council's happy for you to do whatever, you end up with um, two very similar looking areas that have got completely different policies, which isn't popular. Um, so the third option with development plans would be uh, for uh, the planning policy library to include uh, quantitative water sensitive urban design principles of some sort, and I believe that's the next talk by Martin Allen, so I look forward to that one. Um, what this would require is an agreed baseline set of water sensitive urban design principles such as those in the SA WUSID policy, for example. Um, the upside of this one was that it would enable all council, all local government entities or approval authorities in general to rapidly adopt a consistent approach to which water sensitive urban design can then be applied or waived according to need. Um, and this is already action two of the existing SA water sensitive urban design policy. Um, which is why Martin Allen's going to give a chat on it. So um, I guess a downside of this one, um, trying to give a positive and a negative on both fronts uh, for everything we've discussed, is that um, specific local requirements obviously won't be picked up in this process. So if you're going into a dolphin sanctuary or if you're discharging into an existing stream, which we still have some down south of Adelaide, believe it or not, um, uh, your local requirements may be slightly different and it may not suit you, so you may still have to go the other pathway if you're interested in going down that pathway at all. Um, just going forward, yeah. yeah. Engineering service standards. Um, so the next pathway, quite different but similar to the development plan, is that um, through using engineering service standard documents. So development approval is generally issued with development conditions and engineering conditions. Um, Development conditions are usually based on the development plan, uh, whereas engineering conditions can be based on minimum engineering service standards. Um, and these are developed within and by local government, uh, with justification, of course. You can't just go making anything up. Um, but an interesting case study here was that the city of Onkaparinga have implemented runoff flow targets, water quality targets, and even an offset payment scheme for people who can't or prefer not to meet the water quality targets using their engineering service standards arrangements. Um, so this is, this is a successful approach um, and can be taken up within council. Um, I guess speak to Andrew Thomas if you've got any queries on how you might follow a similar pathway. Um, but I guess the, the, the risk with that one is, again, if every council is going their own way, you end up with a lack of uniformity and you get the same problem with, um, you know, driving up, potentially driving up costs uh, for people having to please Arthur here and Martha here, I guess is one way of putting it. Uh, so the next pathway, the residential code. I'm presuming everyone's aware of what these things are. It's um, probably more aware than what I am even, given they're applying them. So I'm just sort of running through on how you might use these uh, things without actually describing what they are. But as, as a brief background, the res code simplifies planning approval for common forms of development um, and applies to things like sheds and carports and verandas as well as single storey and two storey homes. Um, so if you can demonstrate compliance with res code, as it's often called, um, you get a faster and easier approval in theory. Um, but there is no water sensitive urban design mentioned whatsoever in residential code. So it may be possible to implement water sensitive urban design measures um, for new homes and significant additions in res code. Uh, the benefits of this is that it will produce, again, a uniform um, water sensitive urban design implementation, particularly for things like residential developments and infill, which is a big concern. Um, but it is important that any measure that gets taken up on such a grand scale has to be shown to be effective, um, and it's only going to be limited to residential development as well. Um, so if you went down that pathway, you still have commercial, industrial, and larger scale developments that would be, um, well, have to be addressed separately. We're going on to the building code, theoretically? Yes, we are. Um, so the next option was a building code. Um, and I should say any of these things could go hand in hand with each other. There's, it's not, not necessarily going down one pathway. You could go down several of these in a great big team of water sensitive urban design bliss. Um, in 2006, the building code was adopt, uh, ad adapted to include um, a, a 
third pipe water supply to new homes, which is generally a uh, one kilolitre rainwater tank um, in the absence of a third pipe supply. Um, and it may be possible to implement additional water sensitive urban design measures to this code if you've got appropriate technical, economic and social support for it. Um, simple examples would be increasing the rainwater tank size, but if you take it to extremes, you could have lot scale rain gardens, permeable paving, on-site grey water reuse. Um, that's thinking way, way ahead, because um, that's quite controversial. But these are the sorts of things you could do in the building code if you had, as I say, the um, economic and social support behind it. Um, I guess a key thing is that, again, you're more or less restricted to the residential buildings and you have to be able to fit it onto the sort of allotments that are being um, implemented nowadays. So moving on from a building code type approach, you could use ministers' specifications. Um, and I've given the example of the on-site retention of stormwater here, which was discussed earlier today. Um, so these are issued by the planning minister and referenced in the development regulations or in the building code. Um, at present, we have this one, which is well used, as I understand it. Um, certainly people I've spoken to use this to uh, try and get infiltration on site where there are sandy soils present, particularly around um, Adelaide's coast. Um, and I guess there's an opening there to have further specifications. So when we have a technologically... Um, a strong argument for saying, okay, if you've got a, a small site, um, this is a measure you can have, a, have in place that is going to, um, isn't going to be too restricted by your setback requirements. Um, you could have a separate minister specification such that uh, people who are approving development can say, well, there's a cookbook for basically what you're going to do. And the important thing is it's deemed to comply, so you don't have to go through every single design. It will tell them what they tell a homeowner or developer exactly what they have to do um, to progress. Um, limitations to this are similar to the previous in that, it, again, it has to be effective and it has to fit on the development sites that are being approved nowadays. Um, in this case, however, they, they can be wavered, unlike something in the building code, which can be a little bit more difficult to waver if you've got it in there. There we are. Lovely. <coughs> Finally, I just want to have a quick discussion on a levy or offset approach, which could go with many of the measures we've just, uh, well, I've just mentioned. Um, so we know that the opportunity to implement on-site water-sensitive urban design can be difficult. Um, some developers won't be able to do it, and some may prefer not to do it for whatever reason. Um, and I, I was going to talk about how there's issues with infill development, um, and that's going to be 70% of development by 2036, although I understand that statistic is going to change. I haven't heard the latest one, so I look forward to that one in the 30-year plan when it's revised. Um, but the implementation of some sort of offset for developers who are unable to achieve water sensitive urban design, uh, it's been successfully applied in Victoria. Uh, it's currently being applied to some extent in the city of Onkaparinga. Um, and this could be used for uh, new water sensitive urban design works or the big elephant in the room with water sensitive urban design maintenance of what we already have. Um, and it would be great if such a system could be implemented on a case by case basis across local governments um, where they see that they see the need for one. Um, particularly where there's uh, areas with high infill development occurring. Um, and it could, it could allow for focusing on areas where, there, where there's a need, or as I say, maintaining systems which are critical such as um, some of the existing and um, rehabilitated wetlands, which take so much of Adelaide's runoff. And finally, there's the approach of planning reform. Um, so this isn't finalised yet, but there's, there was 22 planning reforms put forward, and many of them are quite relevant to water sensitive urban design. Almost all of them have some relevance, but I think key ones um, are the ones I've sort of listed here. But, uh, so if we took one for an example, um, but so the, the statewide e-planning and um, the standardisation of planning across the state, it's a very good idea. Uh, it would be great if water sensitive urban design was picked up in that process. Um, and things that are uh, like Reform 10, which is looking at to provide simple and clear development pathways, um, seeing a problem in the fact that there's 90% of developments are getting a full merit-based assessment, um, would be... Yeah, it would be beneficial if water sensitive urban design could be captured. If we're going to make it more rapid, that's a good thing. It is a good thing, but um, it would be great if um, 
I guess, future concerns with infrastructure and the environment, both those things, could be picked up and not um, sort of cast aside and kicked down, the, kicked down into the future. Um, so I was going to stop there. If any questions or comments, my details are up there. Um, there will be a final report on this work available soon on the Goiter Institute website. And uh, yes, I've sort of lifted the project team there. Wasn't working in isolation. I should acknowledge David Pesaniti from UniSA as well as Peter Newland, uh, David Kemp, and Stephen Cook from CSIRO.